Good morning. So uh, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, I was a student here 20 years ago. I came back to visit as a professor here 10 years ago. Uh, so I've seen the minus 10, the zero time, and now it's the plus 10. And I'm, I must say that the, the evolution is clearly uh, very impressive. So it's a great pleasure to be back here. It's going to be a very different talk from the one that uh, Jorgen uh, gave. It's going to be one paper and uh, really about the nitty gritty details of what's going on with investment and competition in the, in the US. Uh, a joint work with uh, Herman Gutierrez, who is a PhD student at NYU. So um, I want to show you a couple of stylized facts about uh, the US economy. And then I'm going to argue that uh, they are all connected. Uh, the facts themselves are, are neither very new nor very controversial. Um, so the first fact is that if you look across uh, industries, so typically when I say industries, I mean something like three-digit uh, SIC codes, um, and you look at measures of concentration, and then you take the average concentration across all of these industries, you find, broadly speaking, an increase in concentration across most industries. So uh, here you have two measures of the Herfindahl index. The usual one, the green one, uh, is that one. The, uh, this one, the modified, is when you take into account the fact that you could have two firms that have different names, but they have the same owners, same shareholders, so maybe they are not competing that much. That's another way to weight the, and, and measure the, the Herfindahl. But in both cases, you find uh, a broad increase in the, in the Herfindahl. And... Um, this uh, increase in concentration comes together with increase in profit rates. So here you have the same Herfindahl as before in, in, in red. And in green, that's the learner index computing. Uh, so it's just the price cost margin if you want. So it's uh, sales minus cost of goods sold divided by sales. So if it's uh, like 10%, that means the firms are making a profit margin of 10%. Um, and um, so same thing, you see an increase in, uh, in the profit rates of, of U.S. firms um, over the past uh, 20, uh, 25 years. And uh, so that's about the you know, concentration and profits. And then the other side that I'm interested in is investment. So there's a big debate worldwide, actually. It's not just in the, in the U.S. The same is uh, happening in Europe. I'll talk about Europe in, in the conclusion. Uh, in, to some extent also in many emerging markets for why we, we see a relative weakness of investment. Uh, in some countries, it's really a post-crisis phenomenon. In some countries, it's something that started before. Um, and it's particularly true in the US. So here, this is a very simple measure of relative, you know, whether our firms are investing a lot or not. This is how much they invest relative to how much money they are making. So you, you take net investment, that is the growth rate of the capital stock, and you divide by net operating, uh, by um, the operating surplus. Okay, so that means that if it's 0.2, that means that for a $1 of operating surplus the firm is making, it's plowing back 20 cents as investment. So this 0.2 is roughly the, the average post-war until the, until the 2000s, and since then it's around 10 cents on the dollar. Okay. So relative to how much money they are making, firms are investing less. Um, and uh, when I, later I'll show you this is investment. Now you want to ask, okay, what, what do I mean by investment? So we'll talk about both tangible and intangible investment. Um, so when you think about what are the incentives to invest, uh, I mean, the benchmark theory for investment is uh, Tobin's Q. So this is what you would predict based on Tobin's Q, and this is what firms actually do. So the uh, green line is the net investment. So again, that's the, literally the growth rate of the capital stock. Right? Um, and uh, over time, over the past 25 years, and in red is what you would predict based on the stock market, or based on Tobin's Q. Okay. So... Uh, it fits relatively well, the, this cycle here. Starting around 2000, you see some kind of gap between the valuation of firms and how much they invest. <coughs> and that's very robust to them anyways. You can do that, and you will always find the same uh, kind of 
uh, facts. All right, so, um, so again, these are not very uh, controversial facts. I mean, they, they've been put together over time in many ways. So the concentration fact is a bit more recent because people didn't really notice it before. Um, but, you know, the fact that the stock market is high today is pretty obvious, okay? So uh, there is not much controversy in this fact. There is a lot of controversy in what they mean. Because they can mean, like, nothing. Maybe this measure of concentration are all spurious. Maybe they are not capturing anything related to true competition. Um, to some extent, even the price-cost margin, that's, that's not a direct measure of the markup. There is no reason to think that the capital share is constant, especially if you think about the role of intangible investment. So... Uh, the interpretation of the fact is the one that's, uh, that's controversial. Um, the Q part I find interesting because the Q part already tells you something about where you want to look for the explanation, right? Because any theory based on firms are pessimistic, or firms, managers, investors are pessimistic about the future, forget about it, because that would imply low Q, okay? So there, you have some papers out there that argue where investment is low because, because whatever, we are depressed, because we don't think growth is going to be high, be all of these would work through Q theory. They would predict low Q and therefore low I over K. Okay? But that's the wrong puzzle. In the data, Q is high, and despite the fact that Q is high, investment is low. So you need something that creates a gap between Q and investment. Right? So what could that be? Um, so I'm going to talk about monopoly rents. Okay? That's not the only explanation. You could have governance issues. Uh, you could have uh, mismeasured investment, which I think also is a very plausible explanation. You could have some types of financial constraints that could also uh, play out in that way, okay? So the goal of this paper is to argue that at least some of the investment gap is coming from an increase in monopoly rents, okay? So that's the goal. I want to convince you of that. Okay, so um, how am I going to do that? Well, first, some more motivating, uh, motivating evidence. So now we're going to dig... So obviously, I'll show you the time series. In the time series, there's, not, there's just so much you can say. So we're going to drill into... Industry data and then firm level data, okay? So uh, why do I think there's a connection between this decline in investment and a decline in competition? Well, these are industries, okay, that are sorted. So these are the top five industries and bottom five industries classified by what happened to their own Herfindahl index, okay? So that's a constant group of industries that is defined by the ones for which, these are the industries for which the Herfindahl went up the most, so the more concentration, and these are the industries for which the Herfindahl went up the least. And so in that case, they actually increased significantly their Herfindahl. In that case, it's kind of zero or negative. So the, you know, the industries that, were, that had the smallest change in Herfindahl are close to zero, perhaps a tiny bit less concentrated, but not much action. And then what I plot uh, here is year by year, the, the gap between investment and Q. So if you want, it's like the industry equivalent of that picture. Right? So for each industry, I look at what's the variation of that industry? What would I expect that industry to invest based on this variation? What do they actually invest? I take the difference. So a very negative gap is when an industry has high value and despite that, we don't see much investment. And the question is, where is that gap? Well, that gap is entirely in industries that have become more concentrated. Okay? In industries that have not become more concentrated, if anything, actually, well, it's actually zero. But you know, if anything, it would be slightly positive. Okay? So the gap of investment is coming from industries that have become more concentrated. Okay? So that's consistent with, it's not a proof, but it's consistent with the view that the, the two things are connected. Something that's also very important uh, in, in practice and for what I'm going to do is that now if you drill within each industry, right? So we went from the aggregate time series to the industry. Now we're looking within each industry at firms, okay? And you ask yourself, um, within each industry, where are these uh, stylized facts coming from? That is, increased profit margins, and decline in investment despite high, high profit or despite high values, right? And the answer is it's coming entirely, it's not the average guy in the, it's not the average firm in the industry that does that. It's coming entirely from the leaders. So how do you define leaders? Uh, actually, everything I'm showing you is robust to how you define leaders. You can define leaders, the larger ones, by sales, by uh, book capital, by profits, I like market value the best. So this is, you just take 
if there is 100 firm in the industry, you take the, the first um, uh, 33 by market value, and then uh, you know, one third, one third, one third. Um, or uh, actually, so another way you can do it, which maybe is even more robust. Over, so that's one way to do it when it's with, if you have a constant panel of firms with CompuStat. You probably you have entry and exit, so it's uh, it's not a constant panel. So the, the way we do it is we take the total market value of the industry. Right. So if the total market value of the industry is 100 billion. We take enough firms so that added together, they account for one third of the total market value. Okay? These are the leaders. So it's that they represent a, a constant one third of the total market value of the industry. Um, and that way it's, it's robust to change it in the, in, in the sample composition. Okay, so then what you see here is that that's the top third, that's the bottom third. The bottom third, they are learner index, that is the, the price cost margin. Uh, is stable. If anything, you could say maybe it's slightly slower than before. I think it's kind of flat. And this is what happened to the leaders. The leaders are the ones that have a significant increase in their profit rates. Um, and these are the ones who drop their investment. Okay? So this is how much they invest. And for that measure, by the way, we add capital expenditure plus uh, R&D. Okay? Um, so, and we compare that to their uh, operating income before depreciation. So same idea, you know, how much do they invest relative to some measure of how much money they are making. Um, and what you see is that the big decline in investment relative to how much money they are making, again, that's controlled among the leaders. Okay. So if you want to know what's going on. Now it's the broader view of investment. Yeah, so that's because uh, if you do it at the, so, it, so now the national income in the U.S. have uh, started to, in, to capitalize a lot more than before. So when you use uh, NIPA data or, or BLS data, uh, you have actually uh, their, their broad measure of investment includes a lot of intangible investment. At the firm level, you still have to do it by hand. So you have to decide what you include or you don't include. So we have various definitions of investment. Some try to replicate what people do in national accounts. Some are even broader like you decide to capitalize advertising expenses and stuff like that. This is just capex plus R&D in that case. But it means it's a higher level than what you Yeah, because the operating income before depreciation is, is uh, smaller than the, than the gross operating surplus we had earlier. Um, I don't know which one would be the better measure. I mean, it depends on what you do with, with depreciation as well. Um, so, in that, in that table, if you want, summarizes like all, all of these facts, leader versus uh, laggard. So, you know, if you look at pre-95 or pre two, I mean, 95 is like, that's just the middle of the sample. Um, you used to have, you know, how much capex and R&D are these guys doing? Where are these guys doing one third of it, roughly, and this guy also one third of it? And today, the guys accounting for one third of the market value only do 29% of the total uh, capex and R&D. And um, so that's a decline of uh, six points. If you look at how much they in invest relative to how much money they are making, it was similar. Now it's dropped a lot for these guys. Maybe it dropped a little bit for these guys, but not nearly as much. Uh, this is a measure of their excess return compared to uh, excess return on capital relative to the uh, one-year uh, treasury rate. Again, it's kind of stable for the laggard, but it's much higher for the leaders. So if you summarize, um, industries have become more concentrated. In the aggregate, we see a lack of investment. This lack of investment is coming entirely from industries that have become more concentrated. Within each industry that have become more concentrated, the gap is coming from the leaders of that industry who are surprisingly over the past 10 to 15 years, making a lot of money, a lot more money than before, and investing either not more, but definitely, in fact, less. Okay? So that's, that's the data. Okay? And we want to argue that at least some of it is driven by the fact that competition has declined, and that this is the reason why they don't invest as much. Okay? So what's the challenge? Well, the challenge is identification. The big issue is that entry and exit are both endogenous. So if you think about it, what that means is that um, 
there will be a mechanical connection between investment and concentration. Okay? Any shock which affects uh, future demand or productivity will lead, anticipated shock, I should say, of course. Any anticipated shock about future demand or productivity will lead to a correlation between concentration and investment of the type I showed you. Right? So if there's good news about, say, future demand, you're going to have two things at the same time. More entry, because entrepreneurs will see that this is a growing industry, so they will want to enter. When they enter, of course, you would have a decline in the concentration. And at the same time, of course, the incumbents, in fact, everybody is going to invest more because there is a demand boom. Okay? So that's the key challenge for identification. I thought there was a yeah. In the previous graph, when you have the ratio yeah. between investment and the operators, so yes. if you were to calculate the same ratio excluding intangible, would you find the same difference between leaders and that? Yes, yes. So we actually, in the regression, we do, we do both for everything together and then separately for intangible and intangible. So it is robust to um, both together and separately, tangible and intangible. I'll show you that in a result. Okay, so the key challenge is really that we need to find a way to identify exogenous changes in concentration. Okay? So we have, uh, in, the, in the paper, there's a couple of models in the paper to clarify this point. I don't want to go through because we don't have the time. But like, the, it's not a small bias. Like if you write, this is the benchmark model that we use in macro, you know, like constant, like CES production functions and monopolistic competition, like, F, like the benchmark that we use in the UK Benchmark. model, for instance. Um, then, um, then the, and you take the competitive limit of that thing, then the bias is minus one, literally. So it creates a perfect negative correlation between what you measure as investment and, and concentration. So you want to know, if you see, the bottom line is, if you see changes in concentration, you really want to know where is it coming from. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the big identification <laughs> issue. And then it's even not so easy sometimes to think about what are the testable predictions. Okay. So some of the predictions are really at the industry level, some are at the firm level. So what does competition do to investment? Actually, that's a very, very long-standing issue in, in economics. And the answer depends, right? It depends on exactly what you mean by investment, and it depends on whether you're looking at aggregate or firm level uh, data. So take the, again, the simplest one, which is like, you know, neoclassical uh, model with CES and monopolistic competition. Well, it's easy then, and symmetric then it's easy. More competition means more KJ, so industry J would have higher investment or higher capital stock, but it per firm it would go down. So each firm would be a tiny bit smaller and there would be more firms and more investment in the aggregate. That's, that's the easy one. Um, if you write a model where uh, you have leaders and laggards, so there is heterogeneity, which if you look at micro data is absolutely first order, so you want to take that into account. If you look at these leader laggard models, then the, same, the first prediction is still true, of course. You still have more investment if you increase competition. Um, but it's in many of these cases, what happens is the leader itself, per firm, could end up uh, investing more as well. Okay. Um, and it's really the laggard that becomes smaller when you increase competition. In uh, models of innovation, then it could be ambiguous, of course, because that's essentially the same as the debate. Does competition increase or decrease innovation? Well, we know that in general it's going to be an inverse U uh, curve, and uh, it depends where you are on the curve. So then it's purely an empirical question. Is the US economy in a, you know, on which side of the curve is it? Yeah. Is it at the point where if you increase competition, you would induce leaders to you know, try to invest more or innovate more? Or are you on the side of the curve where there is already too much competition? If you increase a bit more, you actually decline, decrease uh, innovation. Okay, so that, like, then it's really a purely empirical uh, question. So this, that's what we want to do. Okay, so how do we want to do that? Well, we have three ideas. Um, one which is like a natural experiment, one which is like an instrument approach, and the third one which is based on uh, changes in regulation. So they are ranked in terms of, uh, both in terms of how clean the identification is and also how broad the explanation is. So the first one is very clean identification with very narrow set of firms. The middle one is everybody fairly well identified, but, as, but except we still don't know exactly what's driving uh, the concentration in recent years. 
And the last one can explain some of what's going on uh, in, in recent years, and actually interesting when you compare that to Europe. Okay, so the first one is about China. Uh, so the uh, natural experiment in China is that uh, when China, so the, the tariffs between the US and China have been stable for a long time. But before China uh, joined the WTO, every year Congress had to renew these tariffs. And if they failed to renew, then you would jump back to the tariff of the 1920s, which were extremely high. Okay. So it was a threat each year that Congress decided not to renew these reasonable tariffs. Okay. And the good thing is uh, the tariffs actually are pretty low and not that different across industries, but the threat points were very different. Because if they failed to renew, you would jump back to tariffs that were much higher on average and very dispersed across industry. Then when China joined the WTO, that threat disappears because they, they get the PNTR, which is the permanent normal uh, trade relationship status, which means you don't have this threat every year. Now it's forever. Okay. So now the impact that it has, of course, is very different because your threat point was very different ex ante. So there is a large literature showing that that has a big impact on investment and the behavior of these industries. Suddenly, some industries, for some industries, it becomes a lot more profitable to import from China to set up, for Chinese firms to sell in the US or for US firms to set up shop in, in China. Um, so, so that's a clean uh, identification because the, uh, it's truly that's got absolutely nothing to do with the technology or demand for these industries in the US, across industries. So that's the clean identification. Um, the problem, of course, is that uh, it's only manufacturing, so it's about like 10% you know, of the economy. And, uh, and of course, it's foreign competition. So you can't, there's no sense in which you're going to test that with industry level data. Okay, so you have to look at the uh, US leaders. So I'm going to show you that US leaders reacted to an increase in Chinese competition by investing and innovating more, okay, suggesting that the US economy, as it, at least in manufacturing, is in the region where leaders would benefit from more competition. Okay? Then we look at a broader measure of uh, uh, entry and we'll, we'll explore some of what's going on in the 1990s. <coughs> and then we'll talk about regulation. Okay, so let's start with, with China. I think I described the... Uh, so the key, of course, is I want something which is orthogonal to future uh, demand and technology across industries. And the Chinese shock gives me that, for sure. The problem is it's only manufacturing and, and it's the threat of foreign uh, entry. Okay which is not the easiest, easiest one to test, so you need firm level uh, testing. Okay, so just uh, that's the uh, one way to measure the impact of uh, China on the US. So this is average China import competition. So that's the average import penetration. Okay, so how much they import relative to the uh, value added of the, of the industry. So you see the, the growth over time and then the sharp increase from, well, after China uh, accesses WTO. So that's for the aggregate. Um, that's including intra-industry or intra-firm. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is a. Uh, I can keep switching, but I think. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, sorry. Yeah. So okay. So then. So what does China do? Well, you would think China would do two things, right? If you, if you think about so Chinese firm enter. Uh, a particular industry in the US. So what happens? Well, presumably what happens is two things. The, the, weak, the weak US firms are going to die, and the strong US firms are going to get their acts together and do something. Okay? So that's, that's the basic idea. So let's try to see if we see that. So first look at the total number of firms, and these are just uh, classified by their exposure to China. Okay? So the green, low IE, that's low uh, import exposure to China, I'm just counting the number of firms in CompuStat, uh, and the high is the one that are highly exposed to China. And you can see that the one that are, so they are very similar pre-WTO, uh, pre and post-WTO you have this sharp dis the difference between the number of firms declines a lot more when you have high Chinese exposure. Okay, so that's consistent with the view that Chinese entry, what it does, it truncates the distribution of US firms, right? Anybody who's less productive than a Chinese firm is going to disappear. Um, and uh, so this is like the, just like two groups, and this is if you just uh, do the regression and you uh, estimate 
the impact of Chinese competition on the number of firms across all industries. Okay. Uh, and that's the, that's the estimate of the slope. Okay. So it's kind of zero and then it becomes very sharply, uh, right? Uh, that's, that's the number of firms, right? So the, there is no, the description is not, uh, it's the change over time that matters. Okay. So it was kind of stable and then sharply negative after China joined the WTO. Okay. So it truncates the left distribution. What's perhaps more interesting, but that's not so surprising, you would argue, what's more interesting is what happened to the right of the distribution, right? So how do US firms uh, react to that? And uh, they react back to investing more. So this is the average investment per firm, and now per surviving firm, right? Um, normalized so that it's one here, okay? Um, for, again, low Chinese exposure and high Chinese exposure. So that's the industry where the left tail got truncated. The left tail got truncated, but the right tail got bigger. The firms invested actually more in response to Chinese pollution, not less, per firm. Um, and, uh, and this is the actual uh, regression that shows all of these pieces together. Okay, so, all right, so remember, so my instrument is like, are you exposed to China? But I don't want the raw exposure to China because I don't want to, like the fact that China actually enters more in that industry versus that, that could be, that in fact that has to be correlated with the dynamics of that industry. So I don't want that. I want the part which is predicted by this NTR gap. Okay, so it's the predicted impact of China, right, by the NTR gap. And I want to ask what does it do to investment uh, by US firms? So, if you look at, uh, so that's total assets, that's property, prop, and equipment, that's intangible. If you look at the raw effect, okay, so for all the firms together, it's negative, sometimes not very significant, sometimes small, but broadly speaking, it's kind of negative, right? But remember, there are two effects. You kill the left tail, and you change the right tail, okay? So the net effect is kind of maybe weakly negative. But if you break it down by, you know, what does it do to the average firm versus what does it do to the leader, then you see the big difference. Okay. So it's very negative for the average firm, but it's positive for the leader. And, and there, to your point, you see, you have it by total assets, property, plant, and equipment, so that's only physical assets, and intangible. And the coefficients are... <laughs> They're trying to do, I'm still going to keep on track, you know? Um, and um, so... Uh, yeah, so the point you see, it's very similar. I mean, the, it, not only is like the, they are significant, but the magnitudes are kind of similar. And that's something we find everywhere, which is, um, I, could, I guess could have shown you at the beginning as well. The weakness of investment is not a weakness of physical investment. It's a weakness of intangible just as much. Any measure of intangible investment in the US has declined, relatively speaking, in the 2000s. So it's not just that they invest less in plants. They invest less in anything we can measure. Um, so here, actually, it's very similar for PPE and intangible, right? So what do we learn from that? We learn that, uh, at least for manufacturing, the U.S. economy is in, in, a position of comp in, the, is in a position such that if you increase competition, the leaders are going to react by investing more and um, trying to innovate more, okay? All right. Um, so what's the problem with the China experiment? Well, there are, I mean, first of all, it's only one, and then it's only manufacturing, which is a small fraction of the economy today. Um, so we want to do more than that. We want to look at uh, all uh, sectors. How do you do that? Well, you don't, you don't have anything like a China experiment for uh, all the sectors. Okay, so we scratched our head, and we thought, what can we do? Well, there was one hope, which is the late 1990s, uh, because at the time of the uh, internet bubble, you had very large entry rates in many industries. Okay? And the hope was that some of these entry rates were not driven by, by uh, much by future uh, demand, but by valuation, or even predetermined uh, pipelines of uh, VC deals. Okay? So we thought that we could find, hope, perhaps, I mean, that's a question, maybe, maybe we can't, but perhaps we can find some variation because of this very peculiar period in time uh, in entry rates across industry that are actually not, that are orthogonal to uh, future demand, okay? So that's what we do. So we build a measure of excess entry in the 1990s. So 
excess entry is defined as the entry rate minus what I can predict based on all observable at the time. And the observable include, of course, all you know, sales growth in the past and things like that, but they also include valuations today as a predictor of future or demand and analyst forecasts. Okay? So I have the actual forecast of the private sector for what the industry is going to do over the next few years. Okay? Now, what the thing is, when you do that, most of the time, you end up with a very small residual. Because, not surprisingly, firms enter not randomly. So if you, st you start controlling for all of these things, you find that you can actually predict investment rates or entry rates relatively well. So you don't have this big residual. That's true for most time periods except the late 90s because things were crazy enough that even controlling for all of this, you still have enormous variation in entry rates. Okay? Um, and I really mean enormous. Okay? So this is the excess entry measure uh, that we have for the 1990s. So that's the log number of firms. So this is 40%, right? or 0.4 in log units. Okay, so it's gigantic dispersion. Not something you see oftentimes in the US economy, in fact, in any economy. But it does happen in the 1990s. Um, and uh, one hint that uh, maybe this, we call it excess entry, that's because it's in excess of what we can predict. One hint that this is actually perhaps a good uh, name is that it mean reverts afterwards. So this is what happens uh, over the f so this is the 90s, that's the 2000s, and you can see that places where we have lots of excess entry, they tend to mean revert. So you have negative entry in the 2000s and vice versa here. Okay, but of course the test at the end of the day is is this measure truly ortho? Yes. yes. Sorry, just a little. Um, what is an entry in your uh, in your data set? Okay, so the, the data yeah, it's CompuStat. So it is, uh, in a sense, biased by the fact that in Compus that you have only publicly traded firms, so yeah. it depends also on listing and the listing waves Absolutely. in the Absolutely. Yeah. So it's Compus. I should have. Thank you very much. I should have uh, said that. So uh, for what we do, we kind of uh, we need to use CompuStat because that's where we have enough data on investment, different types of investment, intangible and stuff. The drawback is that uh, it's the large firms, and um, the drawback is that the intensive margin, a firm can, drop out of, can enter or drop out of CompuStat while still being a firm, but just deciding to list or not to list. Okay. So we also have entry rates from the BLS, so we make sure that what we say is consistent across um, the two types of measures. So the BLS would be, would be literally everything, so establishment level entry rates. So we make sure that the, the measures are uh, consistent with each other. And the other thing is, at the end of the day, though, because the leaders matter so much, the leaders are kind of always in CompuStat, so the bias is small. But that's just exposed. Uh, ex ante, the bias could have been there, I agree. OK, so, uh, so this is like uh, just to show you that it, you really want to think of, so um, you need to have this excess entry measure, not raw entry. So this is the change in number of firms. And you try to see if that predicts future, so that future sales growth or future value added growth. And generally, it does. Okay. And it's not surprising. I mean, that's the least you could expect. Like, guys enter an industry that are going to boom. They are not stupid. Okay. Uh, the thing is, the good news is the analysts know that. And in fact, they predict it. Okay. So once you start controlling for this uh, observable at the time, including analyst forecast and forward looking valuation measure, then you end up with this excess entry, which actually is completely uh, uncorrelated with future sales growth, future value added growth, and other measures of either productivity or uh, sales at the industry level. So we argue then that, that this is a good instrument for us, right? because it's going to randomly change the number of firms in the industry, and it's not going to correlate with future industry fundamentals. Okay? Therefore, there is no reason for that guy to explain investment. Okay? So the exclusion restriction is that this excess entry would matter for investment only through the number of firms. Uh, yeah, well, so you mean like the startups? Yeah, but again, startups are that they are very small in the aggregate. So there is a lot, of, I mean, you can see the variation across sectors. I mean, telecom is a huge one, for instance. That, that's, that's completely massive. Also, this one, are, these are not very, these are not, these are not startups. Some of it are startups, but many of them are not. Um, Okay, so then, uh, so then, so I guess let's look at this first token. That's the, the simplest one. So the first stage then is you want to predict the Herfindahl, 
and then you, you see our excess entry measure here. Okay? So what, what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us that even if it's an excess entry in the sense that perhaps exposed you wish you hadn't entered, once you've paid the fixed cost, you're there. Okay? So it's persistent over time. It's not fully persistent. Huh? I mean, there is mean reversion, clearly. But it's just mean reversion takes quite a bit of time. So uh, this excess entry predicts less concentration in a fairly persistent way across industry. And if you use that as an instrument for the investment gap, that is controlling for Q, uh, does the air final explain the gap? Then the answer is yes, and it's pretty uh, strong and significant. Okay? Yeah, perfect. All right, so um, then there are different specifications. There are different ways to cluster the standard errors. Uh, this is clustering the standard errors at the industry level. This is using the panels part. It's okay. <laughs> She's more depressed than I am. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then, well, I mean, there, there, there's more specifications we try in the paper. We even try the dynamic one because we know that it's going to mean revert. So I, can, I, know, I know two things. When there is lots of entry in that industry, I know that you're going to be competitive. But I know over time, your relative competitiveness is going to decline. So I can see if your gap drifts over time. And that is also true. Uh, and that's what we test in, in that one, where we, then we have the year fixed effect. Okay. Uh, and it's true. So this is measured. I look at the investment rate. You can look at the size of the firm. That if you accumulate the investment over time, then the same thing uh, happens. All right. OK, so, so let's, read, let's, let's try to summarize what we've learned. The question is, are we in a point today in the US where more competition would have been good for investment and innovation? Okay. And uh, what we find is that for manufacturing, a pretty clean experiment of bringing competition from outside forces the leaders to invest more. Okay. So I, they are in the part of the curve where they would, they would benefit from being, you know, being kicked in the butt and invest more. And that, by the way, is, I mean, uh, for some of other work, I actually is tend to interact with board members and CEOs of large companies. And in private, they actually kind of agree with that. If you ask them, why do you pay so much dividend and why do you, why do you buy back so many shares? Like, what do you want me to make with the money? Nobody's threatening anything. My market share is completely stable. That's, of course, the best thing to do. So I don't think it's inconsistent with the belief of many of these uh, large firms. Okay, so that's a Chinese show. Then for the for the broad economy, we have this instrument based on the 1990s, which shows that, and then the good thing is that's the entire economy, okay, including the service sector and transport and stuff like that. The problem is, so I think that kind of establishes the fact that at least today, at least for the US, more competition would be good for investment. The last thing is, I still don't know why we see this drift in concentration over the past 10 to 15 years, okay? So that's where uh, we try to see if if we could say something based on regulation and, and uh, let me just show you that graph, I guess. Based on regulations, all right? So regulations, well, the problem is that's a mess because there are so many measures of regulation you can imagine and, uh, and they are all very bad, okay? So we tried our best, but I, and, and of course, we don't have an instrument for regulation. So I mean, that's just purely regulation, which is potentially endogenous as well. So the first hint that perhaps something is going on, this is the Herfindahl that you've seen uh, in, in, in red. And in green, uh, it's uh, Section 2 investigations, right? So Section 2 of the Sherman Act is the section you use to enforce antitrust in the US. Okay. And, uh, and of course, legal scholars have already, that's not news, the fact that there's been a sharp decline in Section 2 investigations over the past uh, 10 years, that's known. Okay, so people in the antitrust know that. It just happened to coincide with a sharp increase in the half window. Okay. So at least you can make the case that there is some evidence that there is, leak, there is weaker enforcement in antitrust happened at the same time as this sharp increase in concentration. Okay. Um, I think it's just counting the number of, in of, in of investigation. Such a small number? Yeah. But, okay, I can tell you more, but that's not the only measure, and not all the measures give you that, because you can look at also the fine they impose. The fines have gone up. So, you know, it's kind of, it, it, it's ambiguous. In any case, that's just a time series. There is no meaningful cross-industry variation. Another big one is approval of mergers. 
because this concentration, this happens through exit and mergers, of course. And merger approvals have increased, and today they are higher than ever. Okay? So the, 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 US, the, the regulators in the US have approved pretty much every merger of the past 10 years, and so that helps a lot concentration. Okay? The problem, of course, is, again, that doesn't vary very much across industries. Um, so the one thing that varies across the industry is some measure of uh, the Mercatus Regulation Index. So just, but that's a kind of, uh, it's not a very smart measure. What you do is you take an industry and you just count the number of regulations. There's no sense in which they are weighted by how important they are, stuff like that. Okay? So that's just the total number. You just count the number of restrictions that are, that are imposed on that industry. Okay? That's the total for the US. The good thing with that uh, regression is it does vary across industries. Okay. And so what we check is, is it true that um, we see more concentration in industries? So now this is really, uh, you know, like in the, in the panel. Uh, is it true that we see more concentration in industries that have become more uh, restricted, more regulated? Okay. All right, so that's the first thing. So uh, that's the CR4 ratio, the uh, top four firms concentration ratio, uh, which is, uh, which is which we get directly from the BLS. So we don't even have to construct that one. And so you can see that this regulation index lagged predicts increasing in concentration. Uh, it also predicts the, the Herfindahl. And then, uh, then we can do, we can use this regulation as an instrument to do the, something similar to what we did before. But again, I'm just to be clear, this is the raw number, this is just the actual regulations. So they are not exogenous. Okay? I'm not claiming that I've, I found a way to find exogenous regulations. These are just the regulations. Um, and at least it's consistent with the story. So this regulation predicts the Erfindol. And if you use the predictor the Erfindol uh, based on regulation, it does predict uh, the gap in investment. Well, I think, the, yeah, well, for the politics of it, you would really want to look at industry by industry because it's, I mean, pharmaceuticals, telecoms, airlines, it's very different politics all the time. But broadly speaking, there is just, they are more likely to approve mergers and less likely to enforce antitrust. And the uh, number of restrictions, including entry restrictions, has crept up over time. So it's consistent with that. Um, and uh, OK, so that's the, if you can uh, look at the impact of, on the size of the firm, or how much or the size of the capital stock of the industry, or the net investment rate, and you find these, uh, these effects. OK, so, um, so, like, so like, try to summarize what we've learned from that. Uh, I think that as of now in the US, lack of competition leads to lower investment, in particular by industry leaders. So it's, if you write, so if you, if you think about the type of models that are consistent with that, is these are the models where leaders benefit from competition because it forces them to innovate more. Okay. So through escape competition or through price elasticities. Uh, why is there a, an increase in concentration in the US economy over the past 10 to 15 years? I think that there are two broad classes of explanations. One is technology, the other one is uh, enforcement or regulation. Okay? We found some, some evidence for the idea that it's coming from uh, decreasing antitrust and increasing regulations. Okay? Not saying it's the whole story, there might also be some uh, technological effect. Um, you know, that's, that's really based on like, the idea of platforms or uh, competition among firms in the new economy where increasing returns go up. Um, and therefore, they can more, more uh, the, the, like the optimal size actually could be larger. So that, that might still be true, but I think there's a role for that. And the reason I think that is also because, so in more recent years, uh, in, in more uh, recent uh, months, I've been working on the same thing for Europe. Because I'm, so I, I'm preparing a paper for the Sintra conference at the ECB, uh, is organized in Portugal in, uh, next week, actually in two weeks. And uh, we did kind of something similar for Europe. And what's striking for Europe is that none of that is happening. So in Europe, we see stable or declining concentration. In particular, if we look at these top five industries in the US that have become more concentrated over time, okay, 
they have not become more concerted over time. In, in Europe, in fact, if anything, they've become slightly less concerted over time. And if you look at uh, investment in Europe, now you might say, well, but wait a minute, investment in Europe is still low today. Well, that's true. It's low post-crisis, but it's low and it's exactly in line with valuation. So for Europe, a story based on you know, high risk premium, low valuation, explains the investment, and there is no gap. Um, and uh, profit margins in Europe, in these very same industries where you see industry, where you see higher concentration and higher profit rates in the US, you don't see that in Europe. So that's not very consistent with the view that it's all driven by technology, because these firms compete globally and they have the same kind of technology. It is consistent with the view that uh, there is decreasing antitrust regulation in the, in the US, and in Europe, actually, if anything, antitrust has become more uh, enforced over time. And if you look at measures of concentration, we crossed somewhere, you know, five or ten years ago. So now if you look at basic measure of competition, Europe is more competitive than the US, even though it was definitely not the case in the 1990s. Uh, and finally, if this is true, then I think that uh, we might see a recovery of investment in Europe. That is, now that the risk premium are going down, valuations are going up, I think we're going to see investment picking up in Europe. Uh, well, in the US, I don't think so, because the valuations have been high for five years and they haven't invested anything, so I don't think they're going to change their mind anytime soon. So it's more like a structural slump, uh, slump of investment in the US, and hopefully in Europe it might be more uh, cyclical. Thank you very much. I think she, she, there was a question. No, may I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, well, you have the privilege. You have to speak in the microphone. I, oh, see, sure, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so you didn't speak of the bargaining, uh, maybe uh, power between the shareholders and uh, the firms? Or yeah, yeah. You think this is not no, important? It or, is. Okay. And could it interact with the concentration, possibly? Or? Okay, absolutely. So uh, that's a great question. Well. Look at it. No, it's because we have a paper on that. So, so yeah, so this is like the part of the story which is purely goods market, and we have, so then you, you might ask yourself, well, what do you do with the money? Well, accounting works. So if you don't invest, you're going to pay it out, okay? So what happens, the flip side of everything is, of course, that payout rates, mostly through, through uh, via shares buyback, have increased over time. And you can think, is that just the residual of you know, the fact that you have big monopoly rents and therefore you pay, uh, you pay out your, your dividends. So is that purely the residual of what we see in the goods market? Or is there another channel, which is that the, um, the pressure by shareholders have changed in such a way that even for a given level of good market competition, firms would have increased their payouts, okay? And so initially we had both in the same paper, but as you can see, it's already too long. So we cut it and now we have another paper. We <coughs> test for that channel. You need another instrument because for the same, because ownership is also endogenous. But it turns out they are also very nice and clever uh, instrument for ownership, and they do exactly that, which is an exogenous change in your shareholder base uh, that leads to, uh, you know, more shareholder pressure. We lead firms to cut investment and increase their payouts. And it's not that small, actually. I, th I mean, it might, might not be as large as the good market effect, but it's, it's in the same ballpark. So, yeah, it's there. You have a question? Yes, I was, uh, do, you, do you take into account the cost of the regulation when you are considering the profit of the films? So the profits are just the accounting profits we measure directly. And for the regulation, we just count the number of regulations. There is no... No. No. I mean, not the, the, the direct cost. I mean, if, if it's a cost that they actually, if it shows up as they need to hire lawyers for compliance, well, that would show up in their profits immediately. But if there are some extra costs, we don't directly measure it. Just a curiosity, how would the very first plot that you showed us uh, uh, change if you extend it backward in to the 60s, the 70s in the US concerning concentration? Yeah, but why this CompuStat becomes uh, pre-1980 pre and, and even more so pre-1970, we don't have that many firms CompuStat, so um, there you would switch back to the to BLS data, and uh, I don't know, how far does the Davis Altiwanger series go? I think they go to the 60s, so, but they tend to look more at entry uh, or turnover rather than, uh, rather than, so you can, 
people have noticed this fact about the fact that there is increasing concentration and less entry, but they've noticed it for the flow and the stock separately. So people first notice the, f the flow, actually, the fact that there is less entry and also a bit less exit. Um, and that, I think, you can go back to the 70s with pretty good data. Um, and then you can also, well, if you accumulate over time, you're going to have an impact on the stock, which is the Herfindahl. And for some reason, people notice the stock later. Uh, now, for the stock, it's a bit more, I think you kind of want CompuStat and 1960s, uh, so many industries have very few firms that uh, it's, not, it's hard to compare over time. I think that's my hunch. If you want to do that, I think it's better to do like the top, say, I don't know, top 10 firm concentration ratio because the top 10 are always in CompuStat. So you can do that, then take the industry data for value added from the BLS and then take the ratio. And that, yeah, that we've done and that works as well. Ricardo? I mean, I'm, I'm very persuaded by the, by the various competition argument. Uh, Emmanuel, Pierre Oliveira, I did some of the compositions and they go along the same line. Not me, just as sophisticated as yours. Uh, but I think you're minimizing the, the, the financial market side of, of things. And, and uh, I mean, in bypass in particular, I mean, you can imagine a situation in which offering free put options to the market is, is, is a very profitable activity. And, and, and I think that lots of companies have been doing that. Yeah. In fact, the, buy, the bypass are not, they are announced, but the timing of those things are very correlated with, with the, the performance of, uh, the negative performance of the shares and so on. And I think that you could imagine a, a situation where risk premium has risen and the way that some companies have dealt with it is precisely by offering free puts to the market. No, we, and we, we do, so that's why, so in the paper on governance, we, we you look exactly at that. We look at, whether they finance it, what? So in a time period where the market like safe debt, the guys who can offer safe debt are going to issue the debt and buy back the shares. So that's in the data as well, absolutely. And then, so yeah, so we, we are taking that seriously as well.